Welcome to our online worship service for this morning from Bloomsbury Central Baptist Church. It's really good to see people uh, clicking in and saying hello. Solomon, I see you've raised your hand. I'm guessing that's you saying hi. It's good to see we've got um, three people, I think, on call-in users as well. So uh, welcome to be with us this morning. Uh, we've got uh, a good panel lined up for us this morning, as we do every week. Uh, this morning, we've got Andrea and Susan and John and Hazel, who are going to be bringing our Bible readings, and uh, Keith, who's going to be bringing us the prayers of intercession, and Luke is going to be preaching for us. So uh, we've got a, a feast of worship uh, and engagement with the things of faith this morning. Uh, I'm going to start us in a moment with a call to worship. In silent sanctuaries, in homes or apartments, wherever we are this time of worship, God waits to greet us with joy and wonder. We gather to find ourselves enveloped in grace. During these days of isolation and worry, in this time of uncertainty and fear, Jesus challenges us with the possibility of faith. Even in these times of distancing and caring for others as well as ourselves, we can offer healing and hope to others. In the shadowed evenings when fear lurks outside and we long to hear the lullabies of grace, the Spirit is with us. The light of life shines on us from early morning until end of day, comforting us in the shadows of sleep. Let us pray. God of all love, forgiveness and patience, we rejoice that you have called us into your presence. As many today celebrate Father's Day, we give you thanks for those aspects of your eternal nature that we experience as the perfected love of a father to a child. We thank you for your faithfulness and your protection. And we thank you for your loving embrace that forgives all our failings. And we pray today for those who are fathers and for those who will be new fathers. We pray for those who have lost their fathers and for all those who have never known their fathers. We pray for those fathers who have not been all that they should have been and for those who do not know how to father their children. And we pray for those who have broken or damaged relationships with their own fathers. We rejoice that in the eternal divine movement that is one God, divine parent, eternal son and ever present spirit, we are invited into a relationship with you of love, forgiveness and patience. Amen. The church at Bloomsbury have been pondering how, as a congregation, we can respond to uh, many of the issues raised by the Black Lives Matter uh, protests and the movement. And uh, just to let you know that the, the deacons are going to be having a dedicated deacons meeting um, in just over a week's time to talk about this. And uh, we want to take Bloomsbury's response to this very seriously. So there will be more to come on this. But I just thought that uh, today I would share a couple of resources that uh, I found helpful. So I've put these in the chat for you. It's just a couple of links. The first is a podcast. Uh, if you'd rather not read a book at this stage, but you don't mind sitting and listening for an hour, uh, it's Brené Brown in conversation with Ibram X. Kendi on how to be an anti-racist. And Ibram uh, Kendi's book 
uh, on that same topic is well worth a read if you fancy doing some reading. And the second link is to um, a number of uh, pod podcasts and webinars that the Baptist Union of Great Britain are running and also some historic resources that they have on file. So you may want to explore some of the resources that are coming out from our own Baptist family at this time. We're going to uh, have our first Bible reading in a moment, which is going to be read by uh, John and or Hazel. I am slightly forgetting which one is doing which in which order. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not used to doing the chairing. I'm used to doing the um, reading. I uh, doing the sermon. I've forgotten to do the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray before we have our reading. Loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. John and Hazel, I think it's time for you to uh, bring us our first Bible reading. Our first reading this morning is from Job chapter 14, verses 7 to 15. Job, having lost everything, is visited by three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Each in turn tries to persuade him that human suffering is a result of sin. Zophar has just tried to persuade Job that his guilt deserves punishment. But Job, unaware of his wrongdoings, begs God to make clear his failings. In his despondency, he compares the fate of a tree with that of a human being, saying to Zophar, for there is hope for a tree if it is cut down that it will sprout again and that its shoots will not cease. Though its root grows old in the earth and its stump dies in the ground, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put forth branches like a young plant. But mortals die and are laid low. Humans expire and where are they? As waters fail from a lake and a river wastes away and dries up, so mortals lie down and do not rise again. Until the heavens are no more, they will not awake or be roused out of their sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in show, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If mortals die, will they live again? All the days of my service I would wait until my release should come. You would call and I would answer you. You would long for the work of your hands. Amen. Thank you, John. We're going to have uh, a musical contribution now. This one is not produced by uh, the Bloomsbury Choir. This is a resource that has come to us uh, from beyond, from the Iona community. It's a new hymn that has been written by John Bell. And uh, I, I was very moved when I heard it during the week and it's been offered to congregations to use. So we're going to listen to the Iona community performing uh, John's new song, We Will Meet When the Danger Is Over. I'm just going to ask, has it stopped for some reason? Could you nod at me, John and Hazel, if it stopped? 
Okay, I'm going to try and do that again. I'm very sorry. Um, uh, can I just ask John Hazel whilst I can see, was the sound okay for you? Because I'm being told the sound was terrible uh, from upstairs here. Say that again, John, sorry. The sound is not good, very crackly. Okay, I can't explain that. I'm also getting other messages from people saying the sound's not working. So I'm actually going to scrap it because if we're going to end up with poor sound, I, I don't know what's caused that. It's sounding great on my computer, so we'll have to come back to it another time. So in that case, Hazel, would you be willing to bring us our next reading? The second reading is from Job chapter 19, verses 23 to 27. Job's friends continue trying to persuade him, and in his second attempt, Bildad forcibly tells Job that the wicked will get their deserts. In his response, Job desperately wishes his case could be recorded in some way, and in a rare reference in the Old Testament, expresses the hope that the grave may not be the end. Oh, that my words were written down. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that an iron pen and with lead they were engraved on a rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been rust thus destroyed, then in my flesh I will see God, whom I shall see on my side and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Amen. Thank you, Hazel. Thank you, John. Uh, we're going to be asking Luke now to come and bring us our sermonette for this morning. So I shall just spotlight Luke so that we can see you. And uh, Luke, we're looking forward to what you're bringing us as you open God's word for us today. Thanks, Simon. Uh, it is strange to be doing a different role. Um, Simon said he hasn't chaired before. I've not preached in this context before. Uh, there are many benefits that we're all learning from lockdown. Um, perhaps our commute to church, or definitely our, our commute to church, is a, is a lot uh, shorter. I was able to hastily stuff a piece of freshly baked sourdough into my mouth moments before the service started. Um, so there are some benefits, obviously the technical um, glitches aside, um, it is still good to gather together and I'm looking forward, weirdly, to getting into the text today. But first I'm wondering whether you have read any good books recently and if you have, um, maybe just jot them down in the chat, they're not directly sermon related but it's nice to hear what your recommendations are. Um, so yeah, if you've read a good book recently, do jot it down in the chat section because my reading habits have definitely increased over the last few weeks and I'm running out of books. But one that I have read recently, uh, you can kind of see that there, is this little book of fiction. And I devoured it in, uh, with some haste because it is quite short. It's written by a Japanese author, Genki Kaomura. Um, and despite its title, If Cats Disappeared From The World, it's not really about cats. I, I must admit, when I first picked it up, I did think I don't want to read a book about cats. Um, I am a dog person. But it's not actually really about cats. It primarily explores the, see, the theme of how humans approach death. And the back cover leadingly asks the question, what would you sacrifice for another day of life? So I'm just gonna read you a little excerpt from this book. The last scene ends and the screen goes dark, then the credits roll. If my life were a movie, I'd want it to be memorable in a way, no matter how modest the production was. I'd hope it would mean something to someone, somehow, that it would give them a boost and spur them on. After the credits, life goes on. My hope is that my life would go on in someone's memory. The two hour screening ends. I step outside the theater and the quiet and the darkness envelops me. Do you feel sad? She said as we left the theater. I don't know. I guess it must be rough on you. I don't know. Sorry, I really don't know how I feel right now. 
and I really didn't know. I wasn't sure if I was sad because I was going to die or if I was sad because something really important and meaningful was about to disappear from the world. You can come back and see me at any time, you know, if you ever feel bad, if you're in so much pain, you can't stand it. Her words reached me just as I was about to turn away. Thanks, I said, and headed back up the hill. Wait, she shouted from behind me. One more quiz. Not again. This is the last question, just one more. As she shouted after me, I could see she'd begun to cry. Then seeing her cry made me feel like crying. Okay, I'll give it one last go. Whenever I watch a movie with a sad ending, I always watch it one more time. Do you know why? This time I knew the answer. It's the one thing I remembered well. Yeah, I know. Okay, so what's the answer? Because you're hoping that maybe it'll have a happy ending the next time. I can empathize with the protagonist's friend in this little reading. I think I've mentioned before in another sermon that I have a friend who refuses to watch the end of the film, The Titanic, because in, then in her mind, it allows the ending to be happier. And I have a similar relationship with a favorite TV show of mine from my teen years, or with Philip Pullman's The Amber Spyglass. I do watch and read them again, knowing that sadness ultimately awaits, but with that childlike hope that it might all be different this time around. In that little bit of the book I just read, the protagonist has called upon an ex-girlfriend for help in his time of need. Their lives have moved on from one another, but they have reconnected because of his circumstances of hardship. And that might be a familiar experience for you recently. Or perhaps like me, you can think of someone who has gone the extra mile for you over the last three months. It might have been someone who has bought you your shopping if you've been shielding or unable to get out and about easily. Or perhaps it was a dear friend at the end of the phone who was there when you needed to talk. Maybe it was your employer or the cashier at your local supermarket. It could have been your delivery driver or a healthcare worker. In many ways, we have seen some truly wonderful examples of the best of human behavior since our world was turned upside down in March. And whilst it's sometimes easier and more obvious to draw on all that has been bad, troubling, or downright awful, it is a source of great comfort to me that many of us might be able to think of at least one person who has gone that extra mile in recent weeks. And there are glimmers of hope out there too, from legislation to reform the police force on the cards in the US, to study suggesting that being kind and volunteering will help you live longer. From meaningful discussions about a truly green recovery for our economy, to the apathy towards homelessness being challenged both locally by Bloomsbury and West London citizens amongst others, and nationally through innovative projects in places like Cambridge. If you want to read more about heartening news out there, then check out positive.news, www.positive.news. It's a much needed antidote to the barrage of everything else we receive daily at the moment. And so, like Job, perhaps in the depth of despair, something like hope can truly emerge. Hope may seem naive in the face of COVID-19, systematic racism, a failing economy, a broken and life-threatening immigration system, and a world that is on track to surpass the 2.5 degrees of warming that could prove fatal for many of the world's ecosystems and likely humanity itself. Heck, after reading that out loud again, it does offer a bit of a reality check, doesn't it? It is in these verses that John and Hazel read for us today that we see a shift in Job's narrative and reflections as he begins to articulate something that sounds just a little bit like hope. In this, we are offered perhaps one of the most well-known lines from scripture, for I know that my Redeemer lives. And from it, a hymn that many of you may know. I know that my Redeemer lives, 
what comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead. He lives, my ever-living head. And it is in this use of the word redeemer that we gain an insight into not only the hope that Job is nurturing based on his experiences before, but also the nature of its intimacy as well. The Hebrew word used here is goel, which is used specifically to refer to the deeds that a righteous family member would do for a relative in need. These include buying back the property for someone who has sold their land due to debt, for an Israelite slave who has sold themselves into, be, into poverty to be freed, and slightly more dramatically and definitely less relative, uh, relevant for us, avenging the death of a murdered relative. This signifies a, deeply, a deep intimacy between Job and God. For Job is calling upon God as he might call upon a relative to redeem him, literally to save him from his despair. Job has fallen well beyond debt, his entire life seemingly lost to ill health and destitution, and so calls upon God as he would call upon a kin person. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And this deep longing comes not from a childhood naivety or vain demand, but from the faith that Job has in experiences of God's care in the past as declared in chapter 10 of Job, verses 9 to 12. Remember that you moulded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? Did you, did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese, close me with skin and flesh and knit, my, knit me together with bones and sinews? You gave me life and showed me kindness and in your providence watched over my spirit. And what hope is Job nurturing in his times of despair? That he will see God. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, and my eye shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. The whole of scripture is a witness to this very hope, and that it is a hope that finds fulfilment. In years gone by, I might have ended such a reflection with this sort, the idea that God has been seen and will be seen again, if only we might just have that faith, like Job or the psalmist in Psalm 22. Yet it was you who took me from the womb, you kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help that knowing we have a divine redeemer in the crucified Christ ought to be enough to fill our hearts with hope and encourage us to just keep keeping on. Yet sometimes it isn't, is it? Maybe I am the only one whose hope has wobbled, not just in recent times, but in years gone by. Not moments of disbelief in the divine, for they're different but related but times of uncertainty about the nature of God and how God behaves. The same sense of, if you're there, what the heck are you playing at? Better articulated by Job in earlier parts of the book. Perhaps that's why I balked at the idea of a sermon series engaging with this troubling book. But perhaps we can be certain in a God who redeems, who literally saves us from the depths of despair as a kin person might do for their kin, because we can see this sort of redemption revealed in the actions we reflected on a short while ago. God lives in those actions as God lives in all of creation. As modern day disciples of Jesus Christ, our calling today, perhaps more than ever, is one of hope not exclusively a hope in a distant end time in which we come face to face with our Lord and perhaps the throng of serenading angels, I don't know, but the very current hope of a neighbour checking in, of a world leader acting in kindness and not in fear, a new parent feeding their child, or a church like Bloomsbury asking the hard questions 
and seeking to take yet another difficult step. Redemptive hope is the Christ-like action of protesting against systemic racism or climate change. It's the writing of letters to challenge the lack of toilets and washroom facilities for rough sleepers in Westminster. It's the praying for, the lobbying for, and not letting our own circumstances prevent us remembering the lives of those who live under constant lockdown and fear in places like Palestine and the Yemen. I do not know for certain what kind of hope awaits us, awaits any of us when our time on this earth comes to an end. And many of us may have been confronted with that question recently with our own ill health or the ill health of those close to us. But I do know what hope looks like right now. Or rather, I know what hope feels like right now. Let us not be afraid to hope because we have been redeemed and have the gift to continue redeeming in that dynamic relation of kingdom building with the divine. We are called to bring hope to the world, to be bearers of the light and messengers of the good news. The act of redemption is costly, but it is a cost we are called to embrace. This is not the childish or naive hope I mentioned at the beginning of this reflection, the kind where we come back to a favourite book, hoping the end is happier, but one founded in wisdom and in prayer. We stand on the hopes of generations before us and offer a platform of hope for the generations to follow. It is a profoundly difficult calling, but one we embrace for the well-being not only of ourselves, but for the world around us. He lives to silence all my fears. He lives to wipe away my tears. He lives to calm my troubled heart. He lives all blessings to impart. Amen. Luke, thank you for bringing us that reflection this morning. Before we ask the panellists to come online, we're going to have a moment or two of uh, silence together. I have uh, some friends who are in the Quakers and they were telling me that Quaker meetings by Zoom are very strange because you have a lot of people gathering uh, on a Zoom meeting and then sitting there in collective silence, uh, which uh, is weird until one gets used to it. But we're gonna have a moment of silence now. Um, during the silence, could I invite you uh, to reflect on what you've heard that speaks to you of good news to you personally, uh, maybe good news to our church or good news to the world. So let's think about where the good news is heard for us this morning. A moment of silence. So if I could ask our panellists to uh, turn on their videos and microphones and we'll have a bit of time responding to uh, what it was that uh, you heard and that you've taken from uh, Luke's sermon on this passage from Job. Particularly, it, it seems to me, uh, one of the themes here is this of uh, what does hope mean in situations where things seem profoundly hopeless? And that's a, a question that I, I ponder with uh, myself. Uh, a reminder that if you're in the, uh, in the um, uh, people listening in, you can join in on the chat and we'd be very glad to hear your comments and feed those in as well. Uh, but would somebody like to um, start us off with a uh, reflection? What, what did you hear? What was meaningful to you from this morning's, uh, from this morning's sermon? Well, I won't answer the question specifically that you put. 
Simon, but I would just say that I didn't know very much about Job and I was rather dismissive of it. But I think what I've learned from being forced to read a bit more of it and what Luke has said this morning, I found very helpful. And I think I have a little, a slightly better grasp of what it's all about. So thank you, Luke. That's great, John. Could you say just a little bit more about what it is that struck you as particularly that you hadn't realised before or that's, that's, you know, meaningful to you about this? Well, I think I was impressed with uh, his despair, um, that he really was at the depths of despondency. And then towards the end, he suddenly realises or perhaps slowly comes round to realise that the God he's been thinking of isn't really the God that exists. It was a fabrication of his and the real God uh, was a true friend and helper to him. Mm, that's very interesting. The, the God that we sometimes think we might be believing in is not as helpful as the God that we need to come to believe in. Mm. Who'd like to go next? Andrea. Yeah, I was, um, I mean, it's a positive subject, but it's a hard subject. Um, I was, I guess to start with, I was, um, I was reminded of the times in my life when having just a little bit of hope made all the difference. Sometimes, like, if you don't have a little bit of hope you can't turn a bad situation good because you're not you know i i wouldn't have been prepared for the good um but that said hope is a choice and and it's not very easy to make that choice when everyone around you is depressed or sad or in the same i don't know bad situation that you are um, and I was thinking about a book I read last summer that put that in a very nice context. Sometimes it's not, sometimes the best thing you can do is, um, when something bad happens to you, it's not necessarily finding out who's at fault. It's about you taking control of your emotions because that's, the only way you can move forward. Mm. Yes, the tendency is to blame, isn't it? But maybe that's not always the place to go first. Susan, I can see you're coming in. Yeah, I, I was thinking about the difference between like reading something or listening to a sermon about something and it actually like being convinced by it. Um, I was talking to a friend last night, and, you know, until 3 a.m. as we do, um, about how I mean I, I personally have a lot of mental health issues and how I can be convinced of the fact that hey my friends don't actually hate me and it you know it can make sense on paper and I can go here are all the logical reasons but how do I actually convince myself of that and in the same way with like listening to a sermon or reading you know reading these pastures like, yes, that makes sense. But am I truly convinced by it? Like, I, I, you know, I want to make the choice, as Andrea said, to have hope. But, no, like, thinking logically, oh, yes, I can make that choice. And actually convincing myself, <clears throat> sorry, enough that I can have that hope are different things for me. And, yeah. I'm sorry, that's not very positive. If, you know, anyone has any solutions. No, it's really difficult. How to internalise it in a way that is meaningful to us is, is very difficult. Sometimes, uh, I mean, I, I've spoken about this a little bit before, but I, I had a year, uh, about four years ago, I did a year of psychotherapy. And I guess one of the most meaningful things that came out to me from that was that uh, I was engaging with somebody else who could actually speak words into me that I wasn't able to speak into myself and in a sense um, you know I, I spent time with this guy every week 
he didn't tell me anything I didn't already know at an intellectual level. I'd, I'd already answered all of my own questions, but it wasn't until somebody else could, could intervene to say that stuff back to me that I found myself able to believe it. So maybe there's places sometimes where communities can help us. Um, I mean, Job's friends aren't the best example of this as we will be discovering a bit more next week and had a look at last week. <laughs> Anyway, um, any other reflections on the uh, on the sermon and the passage that we've been living with this morning, Keith? Oh, Keith, you are you are muted to speak, and then you seem to have frozen for a second. Are you are you with us, or are you are you frozen? Okay, I wonder if Keith's internet has gone down. Keith, you might need to just pop out and come back in again. Um, are you there now? I'm really hoping Keith gets this together in a minute on his technology, because Keith's leading the prayers of intercession shortly. Um, let's give <laughs> Keith's, uh, let's give Keith's um, internet a chance to see if it can resolve itself. We're having a great morning for technology today, aren't we? Um, I was very interested, uh, Luke, in what you were saying about uh, sort of the hope that Job will see God coupled with an uncertainty about the nature of God. And I think that probably resonates very deeply with me. I have never yet been able to shake off uh, my hope in God, but I get less and less certain quite what I mean by God as the years go by. And in a one sense, my faith gets deeper as my questioning gets deeper. And uh, those two have, have sort of sat in an uneasy dance in my own faith. Um, I'm just looking at the chat. Liz has come in and said, hope often seems to come with some loss, or perhaps it is that hope can come out of loss. It's hard to realize the God you thought was your God actually is not. There is loss, but also hope in the glimpses of being able to see a God who is different. Hope is a hard choice sometimes. It's okay at the same time. It's okay to hope at the same time as feeling the loss. Um, Keith, I think we've got you back now. You appear to be moving and audible. Uh, did you have uh, a reflection you were about to share when, when everything went silent and still? Yeah, yes, I did. And I was also choking at the same time. So it was, uh, more than just a technical issue. Um, thank you, Luke, for, for explaining the word redeemer. And as Christians, we have a whole host of words, creator, savior, redeemer, whatever, whatever. And we've said them all our life. Um, but to expound that one this morning was really, really helpful. And as, as um, John Hazelwood were reading, as, as, as the words, I, I know that my redeemer liveth came out, we both sort of sat back and, and you know, we could hear um, Handel's Messiah, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that whole sentence now makes a lot more sense um, and, and stressing the no. And, and when we talk about hope, the reason for hope is that we know that our Redeemer lives and, and what our Redeemer is doing for us and what re redemption is all about in a way that years and years of Sunday school teaching and, and, and sermons have, have missed a point. So, you know, I, I'm, that was a, a, an uplifting point in this morning. So th thank you, Luke, very much. Thanks, Keith. Um, I noticed Solomon has popped a note in the chat uh, saying that hope and keeping the faith are virtues that can defeat negativity. So thank you for that, Solomon. Um, uh, yes, Susan. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I really liked what Liz said. Um, and I think that resonates for me, again, on the mental health thing. I'm sorry to keep bringing it back to this, but like, um, there was a time, you know, when I was 17, uh, which was, yeah, or well, three and a bit years ago, not even that long ago. But um, I think at the time, like, that was the year that I was baptized. Um, and, you know, I, I really felt like I was close to God and I was having a great time at church and talking about faith. And I always found that like what I really connected with was the, the natural environment. And 
any time I went outside and just, uh, you know, even looked at a plant, I could be like, oh yeah, that's God. Like, well, I, I remember whenever it rained, I always felt that that was God in everything. And like everything that I connected with in the world, I could find God in. And that was where I found my spirituality. Um, and then I had a period of several months where I was quite dissociated. And um, for those who don't know what dissociation is, it varies a lot. But for me, I personally experienced a lot of disconnect from the world around me. I sort of felt insulated and like I, I wasn't really grounded. And that was just, you know, so hard for me because I, at the time I was feeling terrible and I was like, okay, well, this is when I want to pray and I want to feel that spirituality. And yet everything that I had, well, not everything, but a lot of the things that I had used to feel like I was connected to God, I had lost the ability to actually connect with. And, you know, I was feeling at the time, like, this is when I want to be with God. And how, how can I be with God if I've lost the ability to do that? And yeah, it was hard. And I, and now I actually can't feel the spirituality in the same way from like the natural world. And it is something that, as Liz said, I feel like I've lost in a sense a sense of who god is in that way and i i do kind of mourn that ability to find spirituality in the natural world which i don't have in the same way anymore but i had, probably do have a more nuanced faith coming out of that and i'm sorry i know i didn't add anything to what liz said i just wanted to say that i really connected with it thank you susan um that, that's profound and our faith changes and grows uh, as time goes past. Um, I'm just looking at a couple of the comments in the panel the, from the uh, chat that I'll feed through. Um, Frank noting that uh, Job is an extremely long story about one family, so there should be a lot to learn within these pages. Indeed, there is Frank, uh, the part of the fits in kind of in the wisdom literature in the Hebrew Bible tradition. And uh, I'm interested, Nigel has made the link through to Hebrews in this phrase, we have a hope this hope as an anchor. Actually, there are, there are quite a lot of links between the book of Hebrews and the book of Job and the other uh, wisdom literature. And it's quite clear that the writer of the book of Hebrews is well versed in books like Job and Proverbs uh, and has been reading that stuff as part of the background. Um, Dermot has reminded us that, that hope is the last thing in Pandora's box after all the evils have escaped. So despite the releasing of bad things, hope remained. Conscious that we need to have hope in order to continue to live. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And a reference there to Proverbs 13. So we're getting a number of strands of the Hebrew wisdom tradition coming out here, both in terms of how it feeds through into the New Testament and some of these riches that are there for us within uh, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, as we call it. And it's good that we're spending some time uh, on that. So uh, any other reflections from our panellists? Can, can I go back a bit? Yeah. And it's not um, relevant to what you're talking about now. But going back to Job himself, doesn't he wonder, he doesn't think his calamities have been brought about by sin. Doesn't he wonder why they've been brought about? Because I certainly do. Maybe I'm being very naive or I've missed something, but I do wonder why um, this all happened. Yes, I think that in, in the text, Job is someone who is, I mean, we'll, we'll look a little bit more at this, uh, at this next week. Job is protesting his innocence. So what he's trying to say is basically, I didn't deserve this. It just happened. And although the subject of why do these things happen is clearly there for us in the mind of the reader as we're reading it, we're going like, well, if, was, it, was it God doing it? Did, did, did Job deserve it? And those voices come through in the narrator's voice. And, you know, was it just about a bet that God did? Or as Job's friends come in, oh, come on, mate, you must have done something to deserve it after all. The witness of the text is that Job resists that. And he just keeps going, but... I know that I'm righteous and yet I suffer. 
And the, 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 the invitation to wisdom here is to learn that Job resists the blame game. And we all want to do the blame game. I want to do the blame game. You want to do it. We all want to do it. And Job keeps resisting it. And whoever the author of Job's, the book of Job was, knows that this text will keep asking these questions of us as readers. And we will keep asking these questions of it. And it just continually resists them. It's just going, no, you don't deserve this. And no, God does not do this. Sometimes it just happens. The question is, how do you live when this stuff's happened? So I think it's really interesting that, that the character of Job keeps not going there. I mean, he's, you know, at a historical level, he's a, he's a fictional character. He does what his author has made him do. Um, whether there's a historical character behind us or not, the Job we meet in the text is the Job of the text. But the author is doing this in order to get a result uh, uh, from us who are reading it. And it works, doesn't it? We just sit there screaming at it, going, what's going on here? Why does this happen? And that, there's wisdom in that battle. Okay, I think uh, we will be moving on now. Uh, there's a recommendation in the text from Jeff, which I'll let you uh, copy paste if you want to follow that through. I'm going to ask Keith if he would uh, bring us our prayers of intercession now, please. We come together in prayer as this gathered community from our individual homes. We remember that we are joining with others around London, the nation and the world as one family. So let us pause and find a moment of peace as we lift up our hearts together in prayer. Dear God, we give you thanks. In this time of international crisis, we have cause to give you thanks for all those who play right, vital roles in keeping us alive, keeping us safe and well, and keeping us sane. On a day that has become known as Father's Day, we think especially of our relationships with our families. We give you special thanks for fathers, mothers, grandfathers, grandmothers, siblings, children and grandchildren, and in some cases, great-grandchildren too. We thank you for the love they show us and for the opportunities for us to show them our love and the great blessings we receive from you through our families. Dear God, we pray for those families suffering from physical separation at this moment. For uncles, aunts, grandparents, deny the joy of welcoming and holding a new grandchild. For couples, deny the chance to celebrate a wedding with family. Give them strength now and bless them all with great joy in the future. For those unable to comfort one another on the passing of a loved one, be their comfort. For the lonely, denied contact with their dearest and nearest, give them and their families new strength each day. Bless too the carers who, beside their routine tasks, try to bridge that gap for those in care. And for any family members feeling depressed by the physical distance of mother, father, sister, brother, we pray that you give them your peace. Dear God, we pray for those families suffering from physical confinement at the moment. For those families where love is alien, where this time of lockdown has been a sad or even traumatic time. We think especially of families where abuse takes place. We pray for those partners and children 
trapped in a household with an abusive parent. We pray for the agencies and charities working to relieve that stress. Dear God, we pray too for your wider family. Some of us have seen with our own eyes families living in desperate conditions, in poverty and in refugee camps around the world. We have met the dedicated workers who support these families. We have been overcome by the joy and the welcome shown by families living in such desperate circumstances. We offer support to those agencies working with them. But here, most of all, we hold them up in our prayers to you. God of love, be with them and bless them, we pray. Dear God, we ask for your blessing on this group of your gathered family. We must pray for this, our gathered family of your people gathered but separated, meeting virtually. Help us as we work through this conundrum. Help us to care for the members of this family. Help us to see how to show your love in action through our lives now. Help us not to see the pandemic as a barrier, but as an opportunity to think differently, to act differently. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. As we hear your words, don't be afraid. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So help us, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to have another go at playing the song the, from the Iona community because I would love us to share it together uh, before we go. If I get messages from the team that the sound quality is still bad, I will stop it again and we'll uh, try another time. But let's give it a go and see how we get on.
So let us pray. God, who is with us, by your Spirit, through your Son, we offer to you all of our lives. We offer the good and the bad. We offer our riches and our poverty. At this moment in this service, we specifically dedicate to you all of the gifts that we have given to the work of your kingdom through Bloomsbury. Financial gifts given through bank transfer and in other ways. Gifts of time, gifts of volunteering, gifts given over the years, gifts given over the last few months, gifts given this week. Receive the gifts of our hearts as an offering of love to you. And may we find hope and peace in your receiving all that we bring. Amen. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, creator, redeemer and sustainer, be with us all today and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>